Well, welcome to the Grace Hour. My name is Pastor Pete Westera. I'm the youth director here at Greater Grace, and joined with me today is Pastor Jason Moore with Pastoral Care. <laughs> How you doing? Doing awesome. How are you today? Very good. Very glad to be here. Yes. Uh, we have the most serious of subjects to discuss today. And actually, just before the show, we were talking about how angry we are. Mm. We're so angry about the pornography that is plaguing this country, this world, and men especially, men and women, but men especially, and um, how much pain, how much heartache, and devastating effects the pornography has. And uh, both of us have been involved uh, with young, young men or uh, older men, in my case, young men, uh, many times and sat in our offices and counseled people. And I've had young men uh, weeping in my office, you know, mm. uh, weeping on my shoulder, you know, like uh, just uh, riddled with guilt. Help me. How do I get rid of this? You know? And uh, yeah, we're, we're kind of glad to discuss it. Wouldn't you, wouldn't you say? Yeah, absolutely. Just to expose it for the lie that it is yeah. and to rescue people from yeah. this trap. It's, yeah. it's pervasive. It's, destructive it's underestimated and mm. it's everywhere you know? yeah but there's hope there's, there's a hope. way out wow. yeah there's a way out yeah so we both i think looked into you know maybe talking about some statistics but we i think we both felt the same way that everybody knows it's bad and uh the only way that you uh get through this is either you face the reality that it's a sin or you lie to yourself and um um, the primary statistic, the primary fact that I read this morning, uh, James chapter 1, is that pornography is a sin, right? And that's the problem. That's the pro Now, it has all kinds of devastating effects and all kinds of devastating uh, things that can happen to you and how much damage it can do to your soul, damage it can do to your marriage, damage it can do to your, the sexual health between you and your wife, uh, just so many psychological issues. But the real issue is that it's a sin, and it's going against God's will. And uh, James chapter 1, uh, verse 14, um, is the verse that came to me that I think is really the only thing we need to know, right? Um, and that is that, uh, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away from his own lust. And then verse 15, then when lust has conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it's finished, bringeth forth death. Hmm. That's it. That's it. Everything else is a residual effect. Sin brings death. We're not talking about physical death here. We're talking about, uh, you know, death uh, in, in your life, death in your fellowship with, with God, death in your relationships with others, right? The, the number one statistic is that sin is death, and that's all we need to know. Um, so, yes. Yeah, when you hear that, I mean, it's like it's kind of a sobering thought and uh, how does that really translate? I mean, some use porn as a coping mechanism. Some uh, use it as entertainment. I mean, it's such a it's such a bait and switch, isn't it? It's like, you know, we're addressing maybe um, the animal side of us, but really, the residual outcome is what you just said. It's death. Mm -hmm. It's it's guilt and it's awkwardness and handling the opposite sex as far as even talking to them. Um, men, it's proven that, you know, problem solving in a man, because his, his brain gets rewired. I'll just focus on the men because we deal with men. Um, it rewires the brain and uh, men are unable to problem solve. There's double mindedness. Uh, and also the intimacy factor, you know, can't even have a real conversation because their minds are, are, are divided. Mm. And, uh, but I love this, what you said in James, the anatomy of the temptation is right there. It's yeah. like, you know, temptation is designed to lead us away, to isolate us, and to, uh, to lead us into a place where we're shamed, right? There's shame everywhere all over this. Mm -hmm. what, do you, yeah. what would you say? You see that a lot with the youth, right? Well, that's the thing, shame, because they know, they know, you know, and um, the, usually maybe they're not so much in their teen years, but later teen years or after their teen years, they, they come back to me. And um, 
you know, maybe there's some kind of relationship that I had with them or whatever, so they trust. And uh, um, they know, you know, they, they are just crying uh, and want, want this to go away, but then they, they can't seem to do it, you know. What you said about changing the brain, you know, I read this whole article this morning about, about how alcohol and drugs and all these kind of things change the, bre- the, the pathways in your brain, right? Dopamine, all these kind of things, are, all these words are involved, frontal, front lobe affects the front lobe of your of your you know decision making ability right this is this is facts like everyone knows if you're on heavy drugs or heavy alcohol your brain slowly fries remember the old commercials but then also there's a lot of evidence that you know pornography and sex addiction is exactly the same as mm-hmm. some of these drugs and some of uh, like alcoholism it has the same effects it has the same uh, you know uh, addiction it's just as hard to get rid of and then also it slowly ruins your frontal lobe and you become less and less of the person you were, that God designed you to be and less and less capable of making good decisions. Um, that was interesting to me. Mm. You know, like it makes sense that, you know, if it's just like drugs and alcohol that it actually uh, slowly it's killing me, you know. Mm. The, the, the death part of sin is, is killing me and changing me, you know. So this is depressing, but it is. Yeah. I mean, wouldn't I mean our world is full of I, I thought of a couple words like the consumption of alcohol, right? We be get we get um inebriated or there's intoxication and then there's also this this we're not clear or we're um there's a part of us that's out of control, right? Mm-hmm. It's the same thing with any sexual addictions, it's like the consumption of it it desensitizes, I think, the man in particular. Mm. Um, and that desensita- desensi- desensitization, <laughs> it, what happens is we're no longer um, aware of what the Spirit is doing. We're no longer aware of the consequence of our sin. We're no longer, we're only aware of our pleasure, right? It's just pleasure, pleasure, pleasure. Mm. And pleasure seeks, or pain seeks pleasure, right? Mm. So if someone has something in their heart that they're trying to numb or to, um, to address, this can be a coping mechanism, but it compounds like Jane, like Peter says in two, First Peter two eleven, it wars against your soul. Mm-hmm. So what you're saying is it really um, the side effect of this is not only is it demonic because it's absolutely demonic because the devil is looking to take out mm-hmm. guys right and gals, but specifically. We see this as the sin of Jezebel, right? The Jezebel spirit, uh, the seduction that we read about in Proverbs all over the place. The man is reduced to a piece of bread. Um, you go down into the harlot's way, and it's a, it leads to destruction. I mean, it's very clear throughout the Bible, but somehow we lie to ourselves. I love how you said that. We lie to ourselves because we're desensitized. Yeah. Or we don't think it's as, it's as bad as, ah, it's not hurting anybody. Hmm. You know, it's... There's isolation, and then there's you can hide it, right? But really, it's distru- it's like what you just said. It's the frog in the pan cooking slowly, mm. and sooner or later, he's dead. Wow. Yeah, that's a great example. That's how it is. I, I can't help but think I just read a book last six months ago or so from G. Campbell Morgan about um, how Adam was designed to, you know, perfect and then grew with God. You know, he walked hand in hand in the garden, and his intellect was meant to be uh, growing with God's intellect, being fulfilled, enlightening, being enlightened, you know. And his emotions were geared uh, to express love towards Christ. And, you know, everything he had, everything about him, his will was designed to be submissive. So he was meant to grow into this magnificent human being who would be like Christ, right? And then sin came along. Mm. And sin has been doing the opposite ever since. It's slowly cooking us in the frying pan, right? Mm-hmm. Sin is devastating, has a devastating effect uh, for us. Um, you know, I, I, uh, I don't want to be too negative. Sure. But, and we are, <laughs> we are going to, we're going to, we're going to give you some content and some great thoughts and some encouragement here. That's really the purpose of what we want to do here. But on the other hand, the world is laughing around the subject. They are yes. laughing. You get you get with a group of guys. You go to a business trip. You get with a group of guys, and it's 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 like, yeah, it's they're deceived. They have to deceive themselves, and joke around with each other about it, and make and laugh about these kind of things, because the truth is too hard to face. 
that yeah. you are living in sin is too hard to face. So instead of l- facing the truth and being convicted and being forced to change your ways, well, let's just pretend it's okay. That's uh, the, uh, really another coping mechanism in a sense. That's the only way you can live with yourself, right? You either face God and find grace or you m- talk about the fact that it's not that bad, which is yeah. what I see everywhere, yes. everywhere I go. Even yesterday I was with somebody that was just kind of mocking this, you know, so it's really, you know, difficult, uh, difficult not to highlight how devastating it is, right? Mm-hmm. And compare it to God's holiness, the, our holy God, Jesus Christ, righteous, pure, beautiful. Like, you know, in his light, you know, this does not belong in our lives, right? Yes. So that's beautiful. Well, don't you think, uh, you know, looking at just the, um, just the fruit of it in society, I mean, we visit the jails and, uh, you know, crime and violence and these things, maybe even abuse, um, you know, people enter into, they're seeking to be known, they're seeking to be loved, they're seeking to be valued, they're seeking to be significant, and they don't have that maybe, and they get frustrated, and um, they're triggered, and I think, you know, if, if you're listening today and wondering what to do, I think the first step is to be honest with God mm. and honest with yourself and say, listen, you know, I need help. And what does that really look like? Well, we can be, tr- we can be triggered in psychology. They have the halt, right? Hunger, anger, loneliness, and tiredness, right? Mm. These, are, these are when we're compromised and we're looking for either... Uh, you know, companionship or encouragement or some sort of uh, relief or release. And uh, these are all things that God uh, has given. And I think when we're honest with ourselves, right, we're honest, okay, the devil has gotten in in an area, and how do, how do we address that? We If we try to hide it or if we try to um, justify it, then the, these are just complicating the actual deliverance that God has, hmm. he has granted, he has given the tools for. Beautiful. Triggers, right? Triggers. Triggers. Okay, so we decided we were going to talk about that, and um, the, the passage that came has come to my mind about this subject has been Matthew chapter 4, where Jesus meets the devil. And, um, you know, I love that passage, by the way. I've been kind of meditating on it for a couple months now, on and off. But um, we know when we read uh, in the Gospels, when we read the different versions in all four Gospels, that um, uh, the Holy Spirit almost pushed Jesus into the desert. It was the plan of the Holy Spirit, which means that we know that it was a, you know, uh, you know preordained appointment, right? A divine appointment. God wanted Jesus to go into the desert and meet uh, the devil. And the devil is exposed and, and confronts uh, Jesus in the, devil, in the desert. But it probably wasn't the devil's idea. The devil probably would have wanted to be anywhere else but there with Jesus, right? Um, but what I love about that thought is that um, the place was ordained by God, the desert. Why? Because the devil has, needs tools. The devil needs tools. Hmm. to uh, reach us. He uses, he never, st- I don't know about you, but I've never stood face to face in front of the devil. The devil is subtle hmm. and quiet and in very subtle ways. He uses things and people and computers and phones and all these things, uh, these triggers hmm. to attack us. But in the desert, there was no tools for the desert, for the devil. The only tool he had was a rock. Hmm. Uh, and it was like on, it's like a great example uh, for, for us. Jesus met the devil in the desert, and that's how we, you know, fight this. The first part of this is how, how we have to fight this. We fight this by uh, eliminating the tools that the devil has to trigger and to get us down this road, right? So uh, you have some triggers maybe. Well, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, one thing we talk with the guys about is when, you know, when you're tempted, um, you know, what what is it that you do? You, you have to obviously prepare way ahead of time or what we call declare war on it. It's not something that you can control once you're in, once you're tempted. It's pretty much, it's too late. 
so that that pre that preparedness that pre um uh this your pre-planning is everything really so for instance if you know tiredness so that's a big thing you know you know what are you do when you get tired is is your you know you can have the software you can have all the um your computer you can all all these you know covenant eyes is a great uh, a great browser to protect and to make it more difficult and create jersey barriers to slow down mm. the the momentum when you're mm. tired go to sleep you know if you hang around online or watch a movie you can be triggered and you can see something and, and it, it stimulates your flesh it stimulates your because we're all visual we're very mm. visual so it's like very much like oh i want to see more of that it's like you stop that momentum when you know what your triggers are mm. so you don't give a place to the devil hungry, angry, frustrated, bored, um, disappointed. All these are emotional disruptions that need, that are painful and need to have pleasure to, 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 uh, to heal them. But actually in the Bible, when you have pain, hmm. that pain shows that we're alive and it brings us to God. And yeah. we say, God, you know, I want more of you. Hmm. I don't need to have more of myself or the flesh because that'll never satisfy the deep need of the soul so mm. triggers yeah so i i look at that uh as our first line of defense i love the idea of jersey barriers yeah let's put up some jersey barriers and and our first line of defense is preparation eliminate things uh a word that when you said it you just said boredom is a word that actually i remember when i was younger it was bad it was bad <laughs> i got in trouble every time i was bored Good thing about when you get older, you got kids, you got work, you got ministry. We don't <laughs> no have much, time. We don't have no time. time. <laughs> I got no time to get in trouble. Oh, Praise the Lord. Oh, my goodness. So uh, being bored, too much time, vege- vege- vegetation time. Like, remember Pastor used to talk about, uh, what, is it, what was the word he used to use? Uh, sublimation, just doing yes. nothing, you know, doing nothing yeah. and being entertained by social medias or watching movie after movie or uh, binge watching, right? Yeah. Uh, so, so in boredom, in this kind of ample time that we have available to us, uh, that's where the devil would attack. That would be a tool. I think that would be one of the devil's tools. Um, I'm not much good on my own. I'm not much good when I'm tired. I'm not much good when I don't have, when I'm not busy mm-hmm. with life, you know. And of course, there's a balance and we, there's time for resting. But I think that's a word that uh, stands out to me. The practical side of it is that, yes, we cannot, you know, many, many guys should not have an iPhone in their pocket. They should just not do it. They should just get rid of it. Mm. And I, we live in an environment, uh, praise the Lord, we live in a culture where if, you're, if you don't have an iPhone, good for you, right? We, we walk amongst men here, and if you've if you got an old flip phone, you're the <laughs> coolest guy around, you know what I mean? Like, that's the kind of people that walk around this beautiful church, but... Like that's what's got to happen. You got to get rid of some things. You, you, the laptops, the whatever you got to do, the the um, Netflix accounts, the Instagram accounts. You know, our first line of defense is is the Jersey barriers, and the practical side of this is that you have to get rid of Satan's tools in your life. Make your life a desert, mm. so to speak. You said it last time we talked. Starve it out, right? You use yeah. that word. Starve it out that way. So I love that, and I'm very big on that, and I'm encouraging people. A covenant uh, eyes is great. There's many other tools, many other ways that you can have. Bringing somebody in, how about this subject? Bringing somebody in that you're accountable to. Yes. Talking about it with a pastor, not on Facebook, not with everybody, but just you and one pastor, and you fight with him, right? Um, you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, starving out. I just want to kind of bring emphasis to that, starving mm-hmm. out. It's... You know, again, if you're not feeding it, it's not growing. Whatever you feed will grow. So, again, this is really key that somebody might say, oh, I was born this way, or I have no control, or I have, uh, I'm just, you know, this is my weakness, and so mm-hmm. this could be a thorn in my life. Well, that's a discussion for another time, but the, the big thing is is if we're prepared and taking away the, the tools, then the devil is rendered powerless, right? Because mm-hmm. the only power of sin in my life is any uncrucified area of my life. So... Mm-hmm. So yeah, accountability, you cannot, I have not seen this uh, overcome alone. Right. So 
I always encourage, or I've read that an ag- agopic relationship is key to shame reduction, which means I go to somebody that I love and trust mm. that accepts me or you or whomever we're talking about, and they're able to be honest and they're able to be accountable and to follow the direction of that counselor to say, mm. listen, this is these are ways to strip, to dismantle, to starve out the issue, okay? That's so good. And then... What happens is that pastor, that loved one, or not a peer, but someone that is walking in purity, they, and that's where the power is in our life. That's why Satan attacks purity, is because that's where our power is, because mm. God doesn't rest on anything that's unclean. So, so then we set up a, a, some very simple guidelines and then um, accountability. Mm. Like, how are you doing today? You know, yeah. we need to pray. And, yeah. And it's not like, oh, I can't believe you fell. And it's not like this judgment zone. It's very yeah. much like, hey, I'm not condoning it, but I'm also you know, leading you out of the quicksand with that rope that says, mm-hmm. hey, listen, let's feed the word of God and, and have a walk of faith. Let's get busy, because a lot of it happens through boredom, passivity, apathy. Uh, you know, Let's get busy with new things and replace those voids that, mm-hmm. the, that, the, that, that the devil has stolen, you know? I love that. It's great. I, I, you know, we don't believe in confessionals and, and all this stuff, of course, but, but, you know, we do believe in going to your pastor and asking for help and, conf- and being, having a transparent relationship with your pastor and saying, you know, I, I need help with this or a pastor or uh, someone in our, uh, in your department or pastor Hadley in our church, who is amazing. And, you know, I, I, I think that that's necessary, necessary. Mm-hmm. Stop hiding your sin. Don't hide your sin, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, we're not again. We're not talking about bl- blasting it on Facebook or talking to a hundred people. That's the opposite of what we're talking about. We don't want that. We we that's not necessary, not not helpful. But but going to someone and saying, "I need help. Here's the deal." Uh, that's a beautiful first step. I wonder if God empowers us when we take a step of Absolutely. faith like that, right? Like, and how many men will do that? Very few. Yes, that's the thing. We don't like to ask for help. Yeah, if you and I are, are meeting with ten. 10 men, then I'm thinking it's 10 times more than that out there, right? In our, in our, in our circle, right? The stats, you and I have read them. They're epidemic. I mean, I've eight out of 10 guys. I mean, it can be as that as high as that. Yeah. 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 It's terrible. So, okay. So our first line of defense is, uh, the practical side or preparation side, the Jersey barriers, get rid of Satan's tools. So he can't get to you. He's not going to show up in your living room face-to-face. He doesn't do that. He can't. Um, so what's the second part? The second part is really what are our tools? Uh, God has not left us without tools, right? And this is really, for me, just simple verses. I, I made a list of six verses in the Bible to help me help others with temptations, right? Six keys, six places that I can go to. The first one is, of course, the one that Jesus used immediately in Matthew chapter 4, uh, and that's the Word of God. I have found the Word of God to be a tool for me. Mm. Little by little, as we read our Bibles, as we study our Bibles, as we hear about the Word of God, uh, my brain is being fixed. The wires are being connected. There's some kind of rational thought happening now, you know, because the Word of God is entering into my life. Uh, and um, Jesus said it, it is written. It is, again, it is written. He said it the second time, and then he said it the third time, it is written. Mm. He just quoted himself. He quoted himself uh, to show us why he, you know, he's, why would he say all this, right? You have to think that this whole thing was one big display for us. Satan was defeated the minute he showed up in the desert. This was not to test Jesus, you know what I mean? Like, I mean, he was tested. We know he was he was tested, but but I, I think, like, really, to show us, it is written. That's my, my favorite, you know, go-to. What does the Word of God say? What does the Word of God say about me? When, I'm in, when I've sinned, when I've failed, what does the Word of God say? You know, my, my guilt doesn't help me. Condemnation doesn't help me. The Word of God has to restore me, right, and change me. So that's the first one. Can I jump in real quick? Yeah. How many times have we heard this, Pastor Pete? I'm not a reader. Guys say this all mm-hmm. the time to me. Like, I'm not a reader. Mm-hmm. And I wonder, I wonder because the input is not really like the, the output is more than the input. And then there's like this deficit and this emptiness, like 
and there's this uh, kind of like a restlessness. Mm. And because we're not feeding our soul, because we're not reading and Mm. really paying attention to the it is written, we try to maybe do it with willpower. We try to resist the devil, which is a joke. That verse in First Peter five seven, as we submit to God, and the and the answer to submission is we now come under the authority of God, who now resists mm. temptation. Like if I have a drinking problem and I'm hanging out at the bar, I mean it's just a matter yeah. of time we're going to yeah. be we're going to be into it. So it's like, again, what is feeding my soul? What is constructing my soul? What is what am I meditating on? Mm. Right? Because because Solomon said he had he had an empty brain. And his eyes were outside of his head. Hmm. Like this guy had serious issues. Like, I think he had a thousand women, right? Uh, it was funny. I heard this joke about concubines. One kid thought it, he said porcupines, right? So oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He said he had a thousand porcupines. <laughs> <laughs> Sunday school joke. Yeah. yeah. But, I mean, yeah, I think this is key. Like, what are you feeding your soul? Yeah. What are you meditating yeah. on? Yeah, and we're read. fixing. Yes. Read. Audio Bibles. Like, don't tell me, right? Don't tell us you don't. It's a it's an acquired discipline. I'm not like I don't like pick up books and like jump into them, but I do it out of necessity. Yes, actually. that's it. Yeah. There's a there's a there, we have realized. Yeah. I am a very slow reader. English is my second language. I'm a slow reader. Uh, it, it I have to read pages twice sometimes. On top of that, we don't read easy books. You know, we don't read like a love stories from Hallmark or something. We we you know we're reading sometimes hundred year old books or whatever, and it's tough, but. I'm telling you, it's a, it's necessary. It's yes. n- I'm reading my Bible. I need it. I have learned I'm no good. I need to change my brain waves. I need to mm-hmm. have God's vocabulary in me. And, um, you know, Psalm 107, 20, he sent his word, and it healed them, and it healed them, you know. The word of God has healed me. Mm-hmm. And you said it earlier. Nobody reads anymore. There's a worldwide phenomenon happening that everyone is slowly n- less and less reading. Now, why? Immediately, I get suspicious, right? It's Satan's big, big, big picture, his big plan. He's trying to get people to read every, anything so that they won't read the Bible, right? Mm. And I, I, I sometimes feel like there's legions of, of, de- of demons trying to stop me from reading my Bible. Wow. Legions of demons trying to get me to stop me from going to church. Legions of demons to stop me from living by faith. And legions of demons to stop me from reading my Bible. That's how I feel about it. What is wrong with me? Just read your Bible. Like, right. Like, Lord, help me. You know, the phone I mean, goes off. Everything. The, the, everything. All of a sudden you remember everything you're supposed to do that you forgot. I mean, mm-hmm. like, I like what you just said. It's like spiritual illiteracy. We become mm-hmm. ignorant, and those are advantages. Those are Satan's yes. tools. He's got he's got a handle on you. Remember yeah. Pastor Shallow's message? We don't have any handles on the suitcase. Right. No, no, you know, somebody, nobody can grab us. <laughs> I love it. All right, second thing is the Holy Spirit, Galatians 5.15. So this is, you know, a great verse and and incredible study, really. You know, this chapter now, and in the context of the book, this is the Little Romans, and of course it's a book defending grace and not going back to work, and then out of works, and then out of nowhere, uh, you know, we read um, in verse uh, 15, um, uh, let's see, Walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. You know, mm-hmm. I've always found this chapter to be extremely... At first, I used to think, okay, I understand chapter 1, I understand chapter 2, I understand chapter 3, 4, follows up beautifully, and all of a sudden it starts talking about the Holy Spirit and not walking in the flesh. And it's kind of like changing the subject a little bit, mm-hmm. seemingly, right? But you, the flesh and works are closely related, right? They're the same subject, uh, you cannot overcome your flesh with works. Mm. So, you know, we just gave you, like, our first line of defense, you know, all these things to do, right? Don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. And we believe in that, and we love that. But our second line of defense, our big, our real defense mechanism, you just said it, you know, God helping us, submitting to God and God helping us. Yeah. The Holy Spirit in this verse is what we have to go to because we can't do this in the flesh, if uh, in, and or with uh, with works, you know what I mean. I can't say, okay, I got a problem with this, so I'm going to make some rules in my life to c- overcome this. It doesn't work that way. Mm. The rules can help us; they are secondary defense mechanisms for us, or our first line to help us. But really, ultimately, I need the Holy Spirit in my life. I need the Word of God in my life. I need the Holy Spirit in my life, and the Holy Spirit which I read about and I hear in messages, and the Holy Spirit is the one that can help me with, with the lust of the flesh, right? 
Uh, so that is my number two verse for my temptations. Mm. So, I mean, think about it. It's a supernatural attack yeah. against a natural, we are natural. It's a mm. supernatural attack. So the, the supernatural needs to be addressed in a supernatural way. So the Holy Spirit is, without the Holy Spirit, it just doesn't work. I love this. Walk in the Spirit. So, mm. so let's say the devil wants to isolate you, withdraw depression, anxiety, fear. What, what is my response? Mm. draw near to the, the, to my Bible, to the body. Because if I, if I answer the supernatural temptation with a natural response, we'll be rendered powerless. We will not have the power. So yes, boundaries, yes, tools. But, you know, I, I, I'm thinking of one guy in particular struggled with this for years, divorced his wife, um, and I, I sat with him for about six months. And you know what we studied? We studied a little bit of this, absolutely built a premise, but the core of my conversation with him was how to receive grace. Yeah. And grace healed this guy, no joke. He married back his wife. Wow. And today he's walking with God. And wow. that is a super, na- there was no way. This guy was, he, <laughs> I mean, he was in strip clubs. He was wow. he was going out and wow. acting out, and uh, it was a very uh, a very uh, what's the word impossible situation by sight. But the Holy Spirit convicted him. Mm. He was honest, and he actually uh, did a couple of simple things and walked in the Spirit. And then the Spirit took away his desire. The Spirit resensitized him. And then all of a sudden, he wasn't just consuming something that made him more hungry. He started cons- sinking his teeth into yeah. something that would satisfy the deep nature of his heart. Yeah, beautiful. I, I love this. I mean, there's so much to be said about oh this. Oh, my gosh. We're just... Because uh, that, that, <laughs> that, you know, the Holy Spirit is just like a quick sentence. But, you know, like to me, you know, I read the Word so that I can get ramas from the Holy Spirit. I go to church so I can get a rhema. We go to conferences. You know, I can't, I'm going next month. I go on a conference at uh, Bishkek. I cannot wait. Why am I going? Well, there's a lot of reasons maybe, but one of the things is like I want to be in the Holy Spirit. I want to be with people that are Spirit-filled. I want to be in an environment where the Holy Spirit can, you know, can be present, and yeah. I want to do what I can to, to in, invite the Holy Spirit and not grieve the Holy Spirit. So this is a big subject. My third verse is prayer. And, um, um, you know, th- this is, there's a couple of verses, but, you know, we could say Luke 2, 2 44, uh, and he says, pray that you enter not in tempt- into temptation. You know, that's Luke 2, 44. And uh, in Matthew 5, 13, of course, he says, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us, O evil one, in, in his prayer. So, you know, I told one young man, I want you to pray every single day, every single day, every single day. I don't know what you got to do. Write it on your mirror. I don't know how you drive in your car, whatever you got to do. I want you to pray every single day. This is one of your tools. Use it. Uh, Ask God, ask God to help you, you know. Uh, You know, I have found that uh, if you are praying, uh, it's very hard to live in sin. Uh, it's very hard to be in the flesh, you know what I mean? If you are pr- a praying person, if you are with a bunch of people and you're praying together, it's very hard to you know, have division, right? Through prayer, we can have unity. Through prayer, we usher in the Holy Spirit. Through p- prayer, you know, uh, God, God is present in our life. He's forefront. He's mm. right there. We also become very humble and very meek in prayer, and that's what God is looking for us to do, right? He's not looking for strength to get us out of this. He's looking for humility in prayer. Yeah, these are just intrinsically opposite of what we would think. I mean, what is prayer? I mean, it's talking to God. It's like, okay, maybe we we actually start saying, hey, Lord, I feel like the devil's on my back. I feel pressure. I And we start to talk to God, and and this is how we uh, just pour out our heart to him. And then you know what happens? There's encouragement. There's perspective. There is reminding saying oh remember the last time you did this you felt guilty for several days or there was like self-condemnation there's like this remembrance that comes in uh, when the holy spirit is bears witness to truth that this will not meet your deepest need right Mm -hmm. this will not reinforce my character you know it's interesting too one of the connections i've seen with this is people doubt their salvation 
Hmm. A lot of people doubt their salvation when there's a habitual practice of, of sexual addiction. Hmm. And this is much more than just pornography. This leads into many things, but um, because the flesh needs needs a harder a dose the next time because we get desensitized. But but they doubt their salvation. Like if I was really sa- if I was really saved, why would I be doing this? And the guilt and the vexation and the the sorrow is like so much. Like uh, it's an emotional um, roller coaster. So the person just says. Ah, you know what? I can't fight it. I'm just going to cave into it. And then things really, Isaiah 30, verse 1, they add sin to sin. But prayer, I think prayer is key. Mm. Yeah. Just talk to God. Don't, yeah. Yeah, it doesn't have to be the King James English. Just talk to God. Just yeah. say, God, I'm in trouble. I'm in trouble. Yeah. And then he raises up a standard. Yep. Beautiful. All right. I want to skip quickly through the next two because I want to finish strong with my favorite verse. So the, the next one you already mentioned is really uh, be on fire for God, or you said it in James 4, 7, submit yourselves therefore to God, and uh, you know he will resist the devil, right? He resists the devil. So there's something about our lives when we're all in. God is waiting for us to go all in, right? Uh, passivity doesn't help us. Pass- passive Christians means you're a weak Christian. There's no power for you. You know, as you're saying that about uh, in Hebrews chapter 6, the word slothful, there's where it's slothful. Hebrews chapter 6 is about falling away, saved people falling away, never to be restored, and then it goes into don't be slothful. Mm. So slothfulness leads to a falling away, right? Maybe if we're slothful in this area, we f- slowly fall away, and then it is it, we're, we're walking as if we're not saved anymore. Like, you know, we even doubt that we are saved. So, mm. you know, uh, Timoth- 2 Timothy 2.22 uh, follow righteousness, you know, follow righteousness, flee youthful us, but follow righteousness. So this is just like be on fire for Jesus, be a Jesus freak, go all in, make your life about everything to do with Christ and our Bibles and church and body life and missions. And this is just a beautiful way to live. Uh, the fifth point is uh, 1 Corinthians ten thirteen, and that is God's faithfulness. This is where I really love the, the, the verses. You know, the last two are the best ones. It's not nothing in me. It's nothing in me. No strength in me. There's nothing I can do about that. Like I am pathetically weak in, in this area or areas, right? But God is faithful. First Corinthians ten thirteen. There's no temptation taken you, but such that is common to man. But God is faithful. God is faithful. What incredible hope! Mm. What a beautiful verse. I would if I had this. I I would write this. You know, on the walls of my house everywhere. I would, you know, whatever you got to do, God is faithful, God is faithful, God is faithful. So that's a beautiful verse. But then probably uh, the best one, my favorite one, is grace. And that's uh, Titus 2.12. Grace teaches us to deny um, ungodliness. You know, grace the teacher. Grace is what really will, we, you, you said it earlier, this is what we communicate when we meet with uh, men that struggle with this. Grace, 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 grace. Nothing else is going to get you out of this. Get to know the God of grace because he is the one that really uh, can, um, can help you. This little sentence, uh, Jesus is talking to the, the prostitute laying on the ground. He's writing in the sand, right? He's writing in the sand, and he says these words, uh, Who condemns you? Neither do I. Go and sin no more. Mm. Grace... Go and sin no more. Like, with my grace that I'm giving you right now, I'm showing you love and grace right now. Now go and sin no more. And then, uh, you know, there's so many beautiful things we can say about it. But uh, six months ago, I preached the message about grace being a dictator in our lives. And, yeah, that was awesome. And, yeah. you know, this is really the ultimate. I like wow. to paint the picture. You know, there's someone sitting in front of me, and they are condemning themselves. They are filled with shame. And my words to you is, You know, there's nothing you can do that will change the final outcome. The final outcome for your life is grace. The final outcome for your life is that you will be with Jesus in heaven. And the the only thing that matters, the real reality of you as a Christian, is that you are loved by God and grace is poured out into you. And you got to find roots in that grace. you got to dig deep into that grace because grace will carry you out. Yeah. Well, I I think of a dictator as like, uh, you know, in this sense, it's, you know, we look at a dictator as oppressive yes, and, yes. and very um, selfish and, dicti- yeah. you know, in a very strong way. 
But with grace, it means we're subject to the economy of grace. We yeah. cannot change the heart of God no matter what we do. We can't sin ourselves out of the out of the hand of God in Romans eight thirty seven, uh, and you know John ten twenty eight and twenty nine. I mean, we are held in the in the hand of God. So grace, you know, grace teaches us to change our focus, right? To change our focus to yes. not our sin. Job thirty five is very interesting. Job thirty five six says. Our sin does not change God in so many words. Our sin does not affect God in this mm. sense where he's paid for it, but it affects us. We live in the consequence of all kinds of collateral damage because mm. of sin that we let unchecked in our life. But, mm. but grace changes the focus from my sin or myself to what Christ has done. And yeah. this was what satisfies our hearts. Wow. Because... That's the real issue. I mean, the, we have an insatiability. You know, how many times can we look at one thing and find pleasure in it? I mean, I mean, that's just the way our nature is. And we want it more and more and more. And we get hungry and hungrier and hungrier and disappointed and guilty and shamed. The, the cycle is no wonder people drink themselves into yeah. constantly waking up and they're drinking or they're smoking or they're yeah. chewing or they're... Yeah. They have several partners, which this does. This leads into a multi-partnered relationship that divides and wars against the soul. But yeah. grace comes in and satisfies the heart. Wow. Satisfies the core nature of who yeah. we are in Christ. And it lifts up the work of God. So Beautiful. it's really the answer. It really grace is, the, answer. is the one. The one we have you know, we have the we have our first line of defense and all the practical things, and they're great. And then we have our our, our spiritual war that we pl- face and these six tools that God has given us. And there's more, I'm sure, but I, I have these six verses. And the one that I always end up to gravitating to, uh, the one that fixes me, the one that has saved me, the one that's changed me is grace. And God, show me more of your grace. I, it's so, sometimes it's so hard to believe. Mm-hmm. It's so hard to believe. The other day I had to teach eternal security. I said, isn't it, isn't it hard to believe, eternal security? You know, it's just God. Given, showing us more grace, you know, and uh, that is what we need to overcome this. And uh, you know, just in closing, I would just encourage people um, to fight hard, fight hard, never give up. Ne- in the words of Doctor Stevens, never quit, never mm-hmm. quit, never quit. I don't care how bad things get, you get back up and you keep coming, you keep going, you keep fighting, you keep putting up your barriers, you keep going to these verses, and uh, never let it take you out. Never let it take you out. There is, there is enough grace, there is enough grace to carry you through. And, uh, you know, that is, that is maybe the best thing we can say to people. Fight this thing and never stop and never quit, you know? Yeah. And you're not alone. Yeah. God, God will not change his mind towards yeah. you. Um, you know, I think of Jonah 2.9, those that behold vanity will mm. forsake their own mercy, right? Yeah. There'll be a consequence. But the gain of what you have in fo- in doing it God's way, uh, you'll have a, you'll have satisfaction, not only deliverance, but you'll have satisfaction and contentment mm-hmm. and a real purpose in your life. I think men hide in the shadows when God actually has something excellent for them, mm-hmm. and they never find it, mm-hmm. either because they either don't believe it or they just are captive. Mm-hmm. And um, I know we have to close, but I love it. Don't quit. I get, Get help. Talk to somebody. Um, have a prayer partner. Have somebody that will open scripture with you. Have somebody that you can call when you're under temptation. And then feed your heart. Feed mm. your heart. And it'll control the mind. An empty mind is the devil's playground. But mm. feed the heart. It'll feed the mind and control the body. And uh, you will be a warrior for God. You'll be a kingdom warrior. Uh, weak. I love what uh, it says in Judges, like he was faint. Gideon was faint, but he was pursuing. Hmm. And that's like, this is what happens. We have thorns in our flesh that God says, my grace will meet you and, and be sufficient for hmm. you. So Beautiful. Maybe we can talk more about this. Uh, there's so much more to say, but hmm. this was awesome. Praise the Lord. Thanks for joining us. Lord Jesus, thank you for your amazing tools that you've given us, the Word of God, your Holy Spirit, your faithfulness, the grace, everything, Lord. Thank you so much, and help us, help anyone out there today, and uh, we ask for everyone to feel encouraged about this and to uh, 
fight that battle, Lord, uh, with your help. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.